So rather than a pill for every ill, why not a skill? So in this video, I speak once again with Dr. Alan Watkins. In our last video, he talked a lot about how um, you can use breath work to regulate your physiology. And from there, you're in a much better place to begin regulating your emotions. And in this video, he goes into a lot more detail about that side of it. So actually practicing feeling our emotions and in particular the emotions we want to feel, or the emotions that are useful for us and making that the object of our meditation. Really interesting dude, really interesting stuff. I really hope you enjoy this video. You've mentioned this um, the kind of a part of our maturity being the capacity to generate emotions mm. and, and, and as a result, change of consciousness. And you mentioned the skill of mastery in your book is what you call mm -hmm. it. You're able to kind of imbue an emotion like maybe kindness or mm -hmm. um, even joy or something like mm -hmm. that. Do you have, um, I mean, it's very similar to a very specific example would be meta meditation in, in mm -hmm. Buddhism. Um, do you have any tips on, on how to actually do that? Because I think a lot of people would, would say, you know, well, what you t tell me, just, just be happy. Or, yeah. is, is there more to it than that? Well, there's a lot more to it. So um, we had the great good fortune a, a few years back to do some uh, some research looking at the heart rate variability of the Dalai Lama's team. So we worked with a, 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 a wonderful human being called Matthew Rickard, French by birth. He's sort of basically the uh, go-between between the um, contemplative sciences and the neurosciences. So he's the Dalai Lama's sort of uh, go-between between you know all the neuroscientists in the world and and the contemplators, so the, the Tibetans basically are the world champions of eye of their interior. You know, I mean, Tibet as a nation hasn't built any big you know fang multinational corporations. I think the most advanced technology come out of Tibet is yak butter. <laughs> you know, so they haven't done that, but what they are world champions at is understanding themselves. Um, and so uh, we looked at their uh, biology in different states of meditation. And I was talking to Matthew and he said, well, even the word meditation, meditation is profoundly misunderstood in, in the West. Um, he said, even the word meditation is not really the right word. Uh, he said a better word would have been familiarization. Because when you're meditating, what you're really doing is studying. You know, you're familiar. So if you look at statues of the Buddha, what you'll notice is most of these iconographic statues of the Buddha, the eyes aren't shut so when you when it meditation is taught in the West, close your eyes, everybody. No, 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 don't close your eyes. The Tibetans don't close their eyes. They they lower the eyelids to about eighty percent just to reduce some of the extraneous data coming in. They don't close their eyes. Uh, you know, they just cut out some of the data. And what they're doing is they're concentrating their mind or familiarizing themselves with a certain state, whether it's you know loving kindness or compassion or something called open presence or whatever it is, they're actually studying it like you would study a painting, right? So they're really familiarizing. What does it feel like to be in a state of loving kindness? You know, is the energy going up my body? Is it going down the body? Is it radiating off the body? Is it coming into the body? Is it swirling? You know, does it have a sound, a color, a temperature, intensity? And so the mastery skill is a sort of non-denominational way regardless of what denomination you may have, sort of just scientifically, how do you get that? You don't, you don't need any of that non-denominational overlay, but, you know, either just pay attention. So just sort of lower your eyelids a bit and just sort of look inside and try and when you feel confident, for example, what are you actually feeling? What are you actually feeling? What's the energy? of Not what is confidence as a dictionary definition, but what's the experience of confidence? Um, and the reason people can't maintain confidence, I mean, I taught this to the uh, Olympic athletes in uh, just before London 2012 and Rio 2016. I mean, that was a pretty interesting gig because, um, you know, we got all the athletes together, uh, and this was in the GB rowing squad, uh, and we talked to them about confidence, you know. We said, look, most Olympic squads, you know, in terms of rowing, we'll take that as an example, you row up and down 10 miles a day, or whatever it is, you all do gym sessions where you lift 300 pounds in weight and pull on the rowing machine. You're largely doing the same physical training as each other, right? Who thinks the difference on the day in the Olympic final, who thinks confidence might be the difference between winning and losing a medal? Everybody puts their hand up, right? Who can tell me what it is? Everybody puts their hand down. So that's interesting. So 
you've trained for four years and you've just agreed that probably the thing that will make a difference between meddling and no meddling is confidence, but none of you have got any idea what confidence really is because you haven't familiarized yourself with it. So one of the things I taught them is I trained them how to do that. How do you turn on a state of confidence and embody it? So in that coming up to 2012, there were 15 crews and, and 15 coaches. And I started to explain some of these things. I said, okay, well, who, who wants, you know, who wants to, I said, look, I used to row myself, rowing with my sport, London Home Olympics, 2012. Um, if I'm not with a client, you can have me for free for the next three months. Um, and seven crews put their hand up and eight crews went, oh, that's all right, we're all right, we're covered. You know, we've got all this. And of the seven crews I worked with, six of them got medals. Of the eight crews I didn't work with, only three of them got medals. So and one of the things we were teaching them is, was how to control their breathing uh, and also how to turn on a state of confidence. So rather than before the guy you know, fires the gun and they, get, they go off rowing, uh, rather than sit there on the state boat, as it's called, before the start, panicking, oh my goodness, this is the Olympic final, oh, panic, as they sat there quietly confident. So we showed them how to familiarise themselves with a series of emotional states. So it's a 2,000 metre race with a series. Of, so we plan different emotions at different points of the race and practice that so they could literally turn on emotion at 900 metres, for example, Helen and Heather, who won the gold medal in the women's pair, we trained to turn on at 900 metres a state of excitement, right? And at 900 metres, they took a length because that state of excitement suddenly gave them an energetic burst, um, which gave them an advantage. They were able to apply the power a little bit st more strongly uh, over the next 100 meters, and they took a length out of the field. So this all comes from our mastery of ourselves. So this is what human beings, you know, if you know what you're doing and, and can guide people very precisely, it's really forensic, precise guidance. Um, you know, cutting out all the sort of smoke and mirrors and all the flannel and all the sort of overlay, really precise guidance and show people how to do it properly, people can make incredible progress really quickly. Mm. So it begins with studying the emotion itself uh, in terms of the actual physiology of what that feels like. Yeah. yeah. Then from there, you're more able to actually begin... Familiarising yourself, like confidence, you know, I mean... It's a bit like, if, if you like uh, the metaphor I often use is if you've ever done a wine tasting class, you know, you know nothing about wine. You know, and I don't know hardly anything about wine, but I've done a few of these wine tasting classes and the, and the sommelier would say, well, describe that wine to me. And you go, well, it's white. And he goes, yeah, what else? <laughs> mm, smells like alcohol. You know, I mean, our ability to do that is, is impoverished, right? So what they do is they give you some very precise guidance. Okay, so you say white wine, but is it really, is it golden? Is it, is it uh, you know, translucent? You know, is it sort of frothy? Is it, what is, you know, they, and they give you some clues as to how to describe that wine. And when you smell it, you know, does it, do, what does it smell of? Do you get, do you get different, different types of smells? I mean, is it fruit, for example? Are you smelling fruit? Are you smelling wood? Are you smelling, what do you smell? And they lead the witness a bit. And exactly the same process for an emotion. If you want to master an emotion, you know, we give them clues and there's three sets of clues, which is describe the basic features of an emotion, you know, which is size, location, uh, temperature, color, shape, sound, intensity. Um, so those are the basic features. And then you go to the movement features. Does it move up the body? Does it move down the body? Does it radiate off the body? Does it come into the body? If it radiates off, how far does it radiate off? Does it radiate off? To, to the front, to the back, in all directions, uh, an inch, a foot, two foot, 10 foot, what? So you give people guidance. Uh, and, and what's very interesting, Tom, is that most people have never even had these sorts of thoughts before. But actually, a lot of them know the answers. When you go, well, I've never really thought about it. You know, so I say, well, look, for example, let me, let me give you an example of this. I'm going to play the sound. I mean, you don't realize that emotions have sort of internal sounds associated with them. I'm going to play the sounds of two emotions. See if you can tell the difference between two emotions. One is confidence, you know, and one is relief. So here's the sound. See if you can tell me which one this is. Oh, they go, that's relief. You go, exactly. So relief is a falling note. 
you know, when people feel confident, right, yes, you know, a rising note. So you can distinguish those emotions on the sound. One's a rising note, one's a falling note. Oh, blimey. And so you can do this with all 34,000 emotions. And there are 34,000. Most people don't know more than a dozen. But it's possible to experience 34,000 different emotions. And that's a Tibetan estimate, world champions. Um, so uh, that's what mastery is about, is you can master all these different emotions. And it's an absolute game changer to your life. If you've got navigational capability, you can turn on joy, you can turn on confidence, you can turn on resoluteness, you can turn on focus, you can turn on inspiration, you can turn on reassurance, you can turn on comfort, curiosity, any of these states that are helpful to you, uh, much better to turn those on than just get blown off course into anger, irritation, panic, worry, concern, which is where most people go because they haven't got any control over these things. We talk quite a bit there about, um, you know, leaders and CEOs and Olympians. I was very interested to hear that you've been doing it in schools because I'd, I'd kind of hope to ask you about, you know, what do you see as the future of, of these skills? I know you're working at a very high end now. Do you think there's a grassroots elements to this? Could we? Oh, could we... Definitely. In fact, we're, we're uh, just beta testing a new app, uh, which, we're, which we're currently testing in a, in a school in Buckinghamshire. Uh, with you know, with all the learning uh, support assistance, uh, to put some of the skills that you and I have been talking about today on the phone, so you put it in people's hand, so they can do it for themselves. Uh, and we're just shortly to launch that uh, version of that app within the uh, corporate sector um, to give people the guidance in their hands, so they don't need to rely on a therapist or rely on a tablet or rely on a doctor or a psychologist or whatever is look, you know, here are the skills, you can do it for yourself. Mm. That very, very forensic, precise guidance. So just have a go, just become an experiment yourself, just try and start to regulate these things yourself. Uh, and it's got biofeedback embedded, so you can actually see whether the, your HRV has gone to chaos or not. You can sort of move around the universe of emotions and we've loaded up 2000 emotions on the app for you to play with, but you might want to start in the shallow end of the pool with just four emotions um, and work your way up to the 2000. Um, but just start to become curious about what's possible for you. Um, you know, can you move? You know, I mean, if, if I said to you, how do you feel, Tom? You say, well, I feel okay. Okay, Tom, I want you to move from the state of okay to the state of joy. Well, most people can't do that. Well, why not? Well, they Never, they've never tried it. They don't, they don't know what joy is as an experience. They know what joy is as an intellectual concept. What is it as an experience? Most people don't know because they've never studied it. They've never familiarized or mastered the state of joy. So they simply can't turn it on and they can't sustain it. But the good news is with a bit of practice and the use of the app, you can do this. In fact, we've even built some games in there to help you become more emotionally intelligent, more emotionally illiterate, just by playing a game. You know, so even if you don't want to study, just mess about on the game and you'll improve. And what's the app called, sorry? The Complete App. Complete App, okay. Yeah, and so it'll be out, it'll be out um, later this year for the sort of general uh, usage. We're just testing it in schools uh, and getting a bit of user feedback to make it a bit more user-friendly and testing it in corporations because we think it can have an absolute game-changing effect on mental health, mm. uh, which is a particular interest of mine, um, because mental health is neither mental nor health. Um, it's completely and utterly misunderstood. Um, in most cases of mental health, by the way, uh, there's nothing wrong with your mental processes. So we shouldn't really call it mental, right? In fact, it's stigmatizing to do so. Um, and in fact, a lot of people, if you look at the research, say the effect of the label mental, the stigma that goes with that is more damaging than the actual anxiety they had. Mm -hmm. They've been labeled a mental case. Um, but men mental processes are normal for most people with anxiety and worry and panic and stress and depression. Their mental processes are normal. This is not a mental disorder. So we should stop calling it that, right? What it really is, it's emotional, right? And it's not a health issue either. We should stop medicalizing it, right? It's actually a developmental problem. So if you as a child have never been shown how to gain control of your emotional state, 
then um, you know what happens is uh, you've never developed those skills. So when life becomes a bit more challenging, you panic, right? And the only reason you panic is you've never been trained to not panic. You've never been trained to regulate your emotional state, right? So that's the la- a lack of development. So it's a lack of emotional development. Uh, so it's really emotional development and emotional well-being is what the problem is. It's not mental, mm. right? And it's not health. I mean, it can, if you don't sort it out, lead to health problems. But we must stop medicalizing these things. Um, and actually, when you say, well, actually, this is really emotional well-being, suddenly you know where to, to you know, lean in in terms of what the solution is. Is if we in work in schools and help children to develop these capabilities, then we'll have much less mental health problems, right? Because children who then grow up into adults learn to regulate their emotional state more effectively. Mm. They're less overwhelmed, you know, or, you know, when we're in lockdown, we're separated. You know, for a lot of people, separation has led to a sense of isolation, which then dominoes into a sense of loneliness. And loneliness is very toxic for your health. A lot of data on that. Um, but you can break that collapse of separation. It doesn't necessarily need to lead to a feeling of isolation. It doesn't need to lead to a feeling of loneliness. But you can break that by learning to master your own emotional state. So one doesn't lead to the other. Mm. So if we were teaching this to children in schools, right? our children would grow up with a much greater level of emotional sovereignty and emotional regulation and we wouldn't see all these mental health, even though it's mislabeled as such, mental health issues in adults. Thank you, Alan. That's so insightful. Um, you know, you're a, a doctor. Can you see this being something that the NHS could use? I mean, and I'm talking really specifically about the physiological control of, of breathing techniques and coherent breathing and things like that. Well, well it's happening already, right? And um, because there's a, as you probably know, there's a quantified self movement, which is like the cutting edge of people who got very curious about the relationship between their biology and their psychology. Uh, and, and a lot more people are wearing, you know, whether it's a, a Mio wrist strap or a Kaito ear clip or a Polar H7 or H10, you know, or, you know, the vest or the aura ring, or there's lots more hardware out there, um, you know, where people are tracking their own biology. So it, it doesn't necessarily need the NHS. It just needs human beings to become a bit more, you know, take a bit more responsibility for their own system rather than thinking, you know, everything that's going wrong with me or going right for me, uh, I need the doctor. You don't need the doctor, right? There's a lot you can do yourself. So it's back to education. Education, right, is there's an awful lot. So rather than a pill for every ill, why not a skill, right? So skills, not pills. Um, you know, develop the ability yourself to regulate. There's literally uh, overwhelming, I mean, tons and tons of medical research, the super highway to the, most of the diseases that uh, get people uh, is poorly regulated emotion. That's the super, I mean, there's tons and tons of data because if you don't regulate your emotion, you push your cortisol level up, you drop your DHEA level and that high cortisol, low DHEA level basically drives diabetes, heart disease, cancer, senile dementia, uh, obesity. Uh, all the diseases of modern man are driven by the high cortisol, the body's main stress hormone, and a low DHEA. So that imbalance, you know, which comes from us not regulating our emotional state, increases our risk of all these diseases. So the good news in all of that is you can take back the control. So developing those capabilities is what we can teach in schools. Um, and, you know, uh, the best thing for preventative health. So we don't have to, oh, well, why, why doesn't the NHS do this? Why stop looking outside of yourself for somebody to fix your life? There's tons you can do for yourself pretty cheaply by studying how this thing really works uh, and taking control of it and, and changing your life for the, for the better, frankly. So if somebody's watching this now um, and they would like to get some of these, these benefits, um, would they start with your, your breathe technique, the breathe rhythmically, evenly? Evenly and through the heart. It's spelled breathe 
Tom, to help you remember, <laughs> rhythmically, evenly, and through the heart every day. Spells breathe. So that's the start. That stabilizes your biology. But most of the game is in this familiarization of emotional and getting control of your emotional state. So the breathe skill is the start point, but that's the first step just to stabilize your biology, mm -hmm. generate some coherence, turn the frontal lobes back on, and then use your own cleverness to understand you know, your own emotional state and get greater control of your emotional state. Well, that's where a lot of the game starts. Um, and if people want, you know, they can just find me on, on the internet. You know, there's a, a Alan Watkins on YouTube. You can watch some of the TED Talks, which millions of people have done, that I've done. Uh, you can go to completecoherence.com, our website. There's lots of resources for free uh, on the website. You can get any of the 10 books I've written, uh, Coherence, which is the one you, you waved earlier on, which comes out in its second edition this year. Um, so, or just, just reach out to us, you know, if you're in schools and you wanted to get this going in your school, uh, you know, we've got school programs, you know, if you work in business, you know, we work with lots of different businesses all over the world. So just reach out. You'll be amazed at how much difference you can make to your own life when you know how the human system really works. Alan, thank you so much for sharing all of your knowledge with us today. It's been absolutely excellent. My pleasure, Tom. So I hope you enjoyed hearing what Alan had to say. If you want to see more of Alan, I've done another video with him uh, where we talk more specifically about heart rate variability and coherent breathing and physiological self-regulation. If you enjoyed this video, please do consider hitting the like button. It really helps the channel. And you know, if you're interested in meditation and uh, breath work and self-regulation and yoga, please do hit that subscribe button because I'm making videos with experts um, every month if not every week.